Okay, so here's our third podcast, and today I'm here with MEP, um, Youth Creation. Yeah. I just, you're multi talented, and it's hard to come up with a proper introduction to say everything about you in a short space of time. Mm. So, for an introduction, I'd like you to try and fill in some of the gaps. Okay, so um, yeah, I've been working at Youth Creation for. 11, 12 years now, so since the very beginning when we first opened. So I teach um, music there, guitar and singing. Um, but then in terms of my own career, I'm spoken word artist and musician, I would say. And a teacher. Oh, and teacher <laughs> at a primary school, <laughs> yeah, primary amongst school. other stuff. I'm sure I've got other labels somewhere. <laughs> when did you, is it something like the music now, is it something you got into at a very early age? Um, yes and no. I wasn't one of those children who, uh, sort of like two, three years old, was showing a real interest in music. It wasn't until sort of like my teenage years um, that I discovered that in terms of when it came to GCSEs and, and focusing on exams and stuff like that, whilst I wasn't unacademic, I was, you know, quite talented in in writing and English and stuff like that. The test situations for me yeah. wasn't very good. Music was something that I never seemed to get bored of. I always went back to music. So um, I got my first guitar when I was 15, I think, at Christmas. And I've never had a lesson or anything. And I'm actually not that good a guitarist. At 15? Yeah. Wow. And I, but I, like, what I can play is, is very basic. But I think along the way, I've just sort of taught myself how yeah. to um, what's the saying jack of all trades master and none i can play a bit of yeah. everything but um nothing to a great stand but it was enough for me to get really passionate about music so i would say from like 15 years old and then it's kind of what sort of music was you into at that age well my first my first inspiration musically was actually i was really into reggae music right, right, um yeah. so if you were to sort of look at in in boxes I've got in my room from when I was younger, all of all of my things are like um, I used to collect loads of Bob Marley things. Yeah. So I used to have all of these um, CDs, posters, any sort of little figurines. I used to collect loads of stuff like that. So I was a lot. I was really into reggae music, but I think more so because of what the message was yeah. about the music. A lot of it is sort of about whilst it's sort of upbeat music. A lot of it is about sort of slavery and political injustice and suffering and stuff like that. And I think that resonated with me mm. from that young age. And lyrically, whilst my music style is completely, the, some might say the polar opposite of that, I think lyrically that's that's inspired me over the years to write about things that, that I've suffered with. I don't, I don't think you're that different, to be truthful. <laughs> I, I do see a lot of that influencing the stuff you do, yeah. especially about the message, getting that out there. And yeah. Which, I mean, in your latest one, you got spot on, but yeah. you come to that later on. Uh, so you had no aspirations to make a, a life into music? I was I was in a, a, a band when I was 15 years old in, in year 11 of school, and we sort of chucked together a band. None of us could really play. I think our drummer, she'd had a couple of drum lessons. Our guitarist sort of learned while we were doing it, and I had no intention of being a singer. That was not going to be my thing. Um, but we didn't have a singer, so I was like, okay, I'll give that a go. <laughs> and <laughs> I did that, and over, and we were together, I was like, the course of a year. But then I realised that actually I felt so much more on, at home on, on a stage um, than I did in most sort of social situations, which I think that was a real turning point for me of realising actually that explains quite a lot, that I can stand on a stage in front of hundreds of people and not feel in the slight. I, I mean, I get a little bit nervous, but... Yeah. It's nervous before I go on. Once I'm up there, I don't feel nervous at all. Is that because you're putting a mask on? I think so. And also, it's it's being able to... When you're in front of lots of people, I'm showing a, one particular side of myself, yeah. which is, you know, putting my message across and, and showing that I can be quite confident and speaking about the things I believe in. But that doesn't come with the entirety of my of every aspect of my personality so actually when i come off stage i mean I, I, when i come off stage i'm like this like I'm is that adrenaline literally or... shaking i think it is adrenaline and before i go on stage i'm like that but as soon as i'm up there it just completely goes yeah. 
and I get sort of really nervous. I'm quite a twitchy person, so I get sort of like nervous twitching, and I'll, I'll spend ages before I'm about to go on sort of sweaty palms and sitting there thinking, even if I'm in a bar that I've played that hundreds of times, I'll feel like that, but then as soon as I'm up there, it kind of just yeah goes. I mean, listen to some of your other ones. I mean, the one, I don't know, I don't know names of your, yeah, yeah. your spoken words, stuff, but the one where you put a dress on, on stage. Yeah. If I am woman, does that mean I have to dress like one? To fit the stereotype hair kept with my makeup done? I mean, I wore heels once, but that was just to please my mum. A bit of fun. Ten years old, my astroturfs and the Spurs away kit. Collecting all my match attacks, if I doubled up, then I'd trade it. I wanted them lines in my eyebrows like a bad man, so I shaved it. 16 years and I'm a battle caught in my own skin. I'm a square peg to a round hole and I don't quite fit in. My style was a perfect mix of emo chic and born and raised in a bin. 20 years old and my tomboy style to blokes it don't appeal. But I'm a 24 karat lesbian so for me that's ideal. <laughs> Ladies and gents, sit back, relax, enjoy the view. <laughs> Lock up your sons and daughters please and form an orderly queue. No, I just thought that was fantastic. Yeah. But again, that's using your personal experience and how mm. people view you or how people don't view you. Yeah. Uh, where did that all come from? Is that from the story of your life? Is that what... Yeah, I mean, that, that piece is all... A lot of my stuff is quite heavy. So... That was I, quite light-hearted. I, I wanted to have something light-hearted that I could throw in the middle of a set that so that it's not sort of really a lot of things can be like trigger warnings for some people and pretty hard hitting and I thought I need something in between to break it up yeah. and the one thing that has always been really um, a focal point of my life that actually I didn't care about but it was so fascinating seeing other people's reactions when I, grow, when I was growing up is I've always been a tomboy like from when I was two three years old I, I was a uh, um, on one side of the family, all my cousins are girls, and I've got other girl cousins as well. And we were brought up together, and we always used to get get matching presents at Christmas. And I used to hate it; like they always <laughs> used to get like tiny tears dolls and dresses and stuff like that. And I used to think, oh, I wish I had a football kit. And you know, my mum and dad were really football kit and action, mate. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's it. My mum and dad were really um, sort of supportive and wanted me to be really open about who I was. So I mean, I've always grown up playing with the boys in a um, Tottenham football kit in the woods. Like, that's how I grew up. And actually, they, I was never faced by that. I, it never bothered me. And all through school, I've been pretty um, tough, thick-skinned and resilient. And I've had lots of things said to me, and I always sort of let it brush over. But it wasn't until I got into sort of my adult life that people want to put a label on things yeah. so quickly. And whilst I'm... You know, I'm an openly gay woman, and and very, but I love I love being a woman, and I and but it's so interesting how people sort of want to throw a label on you because you're a woman that dresses yeah. like a boy, but actually that is a, that is all it is. Yeah, that I am just a woman. I who think likes like that. people can't deal with different objectives. They're like, oh no, you you dress in jeans, and so you must hate being a woman. And yeah. It's not that, that it's just embracing womanhood and it yeah. doesn't, I think, do you think it's got easier in the last few years? Yeah, definitely. I think that I'm just very, for me, it's never interested me shopping, anything that's typically girly. It's just not, not something that I'm interested in. So for me, just, you know, jeans and a t-shirt was always what I've grown up in and that's why that's sort of made it light-hearted and you know yeah. taking the mick a bit out of people's perceptions and how they view me and stuff but um I remember when I was writing that poem because anyone who hasn't seen it it's you know a piece that ends in me sort of taking off what I'm wearing and putting a dress on <laughs> and the idea that I was going to do that I thought okay that's what I'm going to do and um but I hadn't really rehearsed it that many times I mean I, I spent <laughs> a couple of times putting it on and then taking it off and then my first couple of gigs, I didn't really, th and it wasn't until it was building up to it that I thought, oh my God, I'm actually going to take my clothes off now. <laughs> and, it was that dawning moment. and there's been a couple of times where I haven't quite got the dress on in time and it's been a little bit, no, it always tends to go down well with that piece. But I, I think that's it. It's, as you say, it's a light-hearted piece in mm. amongst some pretty heavy stuff. Where do you get your inspiration? Is that from a personal struggle? Um, yeah. I mean, I've, I've 
all of my social media and all of my material is the message is quite is quite simple in the fact that I really think it's important, especially nowadays, especially for young children and teenagers, to be talking positively about mental health as much as people do negatively. Yeah. So it, it, that seems like a crazy thing to say because there are certain people who think, well, what is the positive of having mental health issues? Well, there aren't many because actually mental health makes you, whether people like to hear it or not, pretty unlikable in many yeah. cases. You know, sort of flaky with plans, quite sometimes aggressive, really emotional, um, a bit standoffish, a bit selfish. But I, what I've realised is that through having mental health issues, actually, when I realised that I could be open about that, when I realised that I could spread that sort of message and awareness and put that into my own material, and if I used all of the energy I have, because I have, you know mental health, or I speak about it as a passing, but it's still very much an issue in my life. Yeah. Um, and what if, when I use all of that sort of energy and adrenaline and upset and anxiety and put that into something creative, that's when I come out with something that's actually worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as I say, the the track on, what would you call your spoken word piece on mental health? Um, volume control. Volume control. Imagine if you will volume control. You know the twisty knob on a stereo or a car radio? Now imagine it's at 100 that it keeps spinning round and no matter how much you want it to, it won't turn down. Now imagine that cacophony in the caverns of my head because it's only getting louder when I try and go to bed. This every wire of my brain being caught on a sound. It's the lights, it's the chaos of a merry-go-round. Because I'm tuned in to higher things, distracted by higher things. I grow wings, my soul sings, distracted by higher things. It's the adrenaline of waiting for a beat to drop. It makes me sick to my stomach, but I don't want it to stop. Adderall and Ritalin, Metadate and Follicin, Citralopam, Diazepam, Prozac and Quetiapin. I'm thankful for the relief, though it's brief, but then I miss me. I miss the me I used to be. I ain't broke, so don't fix me. 28 years it took for them to give me a label. Took 28 years for them to call me unstable. But just because you want to give something a name, essentially it's irrelevant, I'm exactly the same. I mean, that hit so many right notes for so many people. Mm. And yeah, I mean, I listened to it and I was like, I've got to show my clients this. Yeah. You know, because, and it was, that was like, that's me. Yeah. That, that's me. And I think you, for a lot of people, you summed up how they struggle in their day-to-day -day life but it doesn't mean they're not normal. Mm. It's how, look, my day-to-day -day life is chaotic in my head, yeah. but I'm still functioning. I'm still yeah. doing this. Um, and I, I, I put it to like, a lot of volunteers. So on one of my projects I've done was footpaths, where I've got people coming onto a course for 12 weeks, mm. and we've got them working in cafes and you know, garden centres. And some of the, the criticism we got back was they weren't learning and they weren't picking up things. But what people don't seem to twig is that inside their head, they're so panicky about getting something wrong. Yeah. That for them, if you can read their thoughts, they're worrying about, oh, I can't do this, I can't do this. And there's someone there telling them how to do it. And then more gets them more worried. Oh, I'm going to look fall, you can get angry. If yeah. I and they're not, they stop listening to that person's instructions and they start panicking more and more in their head. Mm. And... So I think the way we approach mental health in, in work and all that does need to change. Yeah, definitely. And you now listening to your piece, I think it helps get that word out there. Mm. And I think a lot of people can take inspiration from that. Where do you see, is it something you want to get more and more involved in as you go along? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if I'd, I'm, I've always been quite an ambitious person in the last sort of year since this has all taken off sort of in the direction that I really wanted it to go in, that's only sort of spurred me more to think about where I want to go with this. And primarily the end goal for me is I'd love to be able to, you know, whilst building up, it's, being an artist is an incredible platform to sort of spread awareness. So I feel like as I'm moving up the sort of ranks, as you will, in my career it's also the awareness that's being spread at the yeah. same time it's like they're both sort of guiding each other through and I'd love to be a to be at a stage eventually where this can be something that I do constantly where I'm you know 
going to different schools and youth groups and because I, I I do get to do that in my job day to day so I'm always working with children but to be able to travel and to and to spread that around and to share that with as many people mm. as possible is, is the end goal for me. I mean I see a lot of uh, the youth creation videos yeah where you have like the, the end of summer camp or the, yeah. and it is just crazy fun yeah you know all the stuff that you do with them and you know some of the little tracks that you do are, are really funny yeah and, and I think that when you do suffer from mental health, having that lightness side of it uh, can really, you know. Yeah. And also, you're getting into sort of almost like gratification mm. because you're making a difference to those kids' lives immediately. If you make a kid who's really down laugh and have fun, yeah. you know how that benefits their mental health. Yeah. And, and I've, I've always said, like, this is um, Jody who, who runs Youth Creation. I've always said there can be so many people who are quick to write you off when you've got mental health issues mm. that um, Emmy won't be very good at that or, or we won't trust Emmy with that. Or And um, it was really good for me because I, there was a sort of stage in my life where I didn't really know what I was and what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And I was kind of working in dead-end jobs and quitting after a few weeks and then feeling really low in myself and... I knew that all I wanted to do was music, but so often I was told that that wasn't a feasible career to want to have, even though I knew that I would be very good at teaching and, and good at, and, and I knew that I, I was confident in a way of my ability in music. And, you know, Jodie given me that opportunity to work at Youth Creation, which essentially started off just me sort of volunteering a few hours here and there, which is... You know, we work so much of the time now, constantly. I mean, Jody, Shannon, Rob, all, the whole team work day in, day out. It's a constant round the clock job. And it's nice for me because I have my full time job, but then I can like dip in and out of, of working a youth creation, whether that be just like volunteering a few hours here, going to a competition, yeah. working all day Sunday, just being a part of that. And I, the thing I love the most about that is I so wish when I was 15, when I was feeling, you know, completely lost and not really not knowing who I was as a person, I would have loved somewhere like Youth Creation. Mm. I would have I would have gone to every class there was available because that would have got me out of so many bad situations that were yeah. negative for my mental health. Because I, I had such low self-esteem at school and I used to spend a lot of time really upset and confused and angry and felt like the whole world was against me but actually I don't think I was put I was I was fulfilling my potential I think that was the problem um and because now in my adult life even now when I sort of go off and I get angry or I'm having a really down day or having a low spell I know that if I go out and do a gig or if I sit down on my piano or if I write something down that is going to almost instantly make me feel better yeah. so knowing that I can do that whether that be the kids at school, youth creation, or just helping out with things outside of school through this sort of spoken word mental health journey, I, I know that that is having a, a yeah. good effect. And that's, there's nothing more rewarding than that for me. So my stomach just grumbled. <laughs> pick up right on my I keep it, every time I drink my tea, I'm like trying to swig it really quiet. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so you can check that's recording. Without ricking all the cameras. It's just start getting paranoid and things like that. Yeah, that's all right. That's the main one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, now going back to your Sunday work, I mean, my daughter come down and she done youth creation for a year. Yeah. And the music, uh, the singing lessons mm. that you done with her, I know that had a big impact on her because she used to be very, very confident as a younger child. And mm. I mean, I think the age of four, she was on stage at, in Grey's and doing like little dance shows yeah. and all that. Um, but something knocked her confidence and she lost all of that. So we took her to Youth Creation to build up her confidence yeah. again. And I see it now in my other daughter, Emily, that in the schools and the dance they do. Uh, so when Jodie and Shannon go in and Rob, yeah, yeah. they do all the dancing. And she comes back and she loves it. And it gives that learning through a PE, through dance, or whatever yeah. you want to call it. But it inspires her to sing, dance, 
again, that, that's great. Yeah. I don't think, that, especially in today's world, kids are more likely to spend hours on YouTube and PlayStations. Yeah. And I think it's a really important thing to not forget yeah. other ways of teaching. And I always think that when we do like our summer schools and, and stuff like that, and people, I always say this, I feel like a sort of broken record when I talk about this, but people are so quick to sort of brandish performing arts a waste of time yeah. because it's not seen as like a useful academic subject. But I always say when we do a summer school or an Easter school or something like that, how often are you going to be in a situation where you can get a hunt? Because we did have a hundred kids last time, a hundred children from all different walks of life, all brought together for a week doing so- where they're not on the streets, where they're not sitting in front of a TV screen yeah. or an iPad or bored or just waiting for someone to, or just texting. I know for myself that I sit on my phone for hours when I've got nothing else to do, and for kids that must be even even yeah. harder to get off. And for them to be, especially only children as well, if you're an only child, meeting other children, socialising and doing something you love for a whole week, I think the impact that that has is really powerful. Oh, it's inspiring. It inspires children to go and continue doing stuff and not that yeah. afterwards. Um, dancing or get more interested in music. I know just doing sort of stuff that you've created inspired my daughter to like start learning like the piano or... Yeah. And you know, we've got a cousin who lives in New Zealand who's in bands and you know he's doing really well and that inspires her. Yeah. So just being around that sort of people that are interested in music is valuable. Mm. And okay, she does spend a lot of time on YouTube and yeah. watching videos. But the content she watches I think are, are, are quite good. They're not it's not all drill music and all that. Yeah. No, she watches a lot of inspirational stuff. Um even, I know people, like it's like Zoella and Joe Sugg, yeah. all that. But I find, again, it's that they talk about mental health a lot. Yeah. Um, so Zoella's the uh, mind mental health right. um, ambassador for social media. Um, so they always talk about anxiety, how to deal with anxiety. Um, so I do think there is support online for mental health. But yeah. again, it's something that people, again, can take the mickey out of. Mm. And I do think in today's world, there's still this problem that if you do get labelled with a mental health condition, mm. that you're seen as not worthy as yeah. somebody else. Definitely. Or that, oh, don't give it to them, they can't do the job because they've got anxiety. Yeah. Too. And, and uh, that annoys me. I would say last October, a year now, I got diagnosed with anxiety. Mm. And that's like after 13 years of teaching it. Yeah. So that comes as a big surprise to me. And I'm like, and I beat myself up even more because I'm thinking I've let myself down because for 13 years I've been able to teach people not you know, how to cope with it. Yeah. And I didn't see it myself. And then some people question, should I be doing the job that I'm doing? Mm. Well, actually, I should even more be doing that job because I now know yeah, what don't exactly. work and what does work. Mm. And I think for you, that there's no better teaching in, in in the sort of the mental health stuff than yourself because yeah. you've been through you found coping mechanisms yeah. do you think your music is a coping mechanism yeah I, I always say that like music and writing is like is is therapy to me yeah i've never been able to there have been stages in my life where i've been doing a little bit less of of music or haven't been gigging as much or haven't been writing as much and i always link that and get re- when I'm feeling low, I'll get really low, and then next thing, I'll get ill, and I'll because that's a, it. Just it's so true that emotional pain does manifest into physical yeah. pain. So then I'll get ill and I'll get a cold, and then that will stop me gigging. And then when I stop gigging, then I'm really low, and it's just a spiral. Yeah. And that kind of, and I realise that when I am busy, as much as I moan about being busy and like, oh, I've got time for that, I actually love it. I think it's my saving grace because I think if I stopped for too long. I'd probably start feeling low and get bored, and actually, I might as well put all of because I've got a lot of a lot of what I call mind energy actually. Because whilst I'm not physically massively hyperactive, my brain sort of works at 100 constantly. So I feel all of that energy that's up there, I need to be putting that somewhere. Yeah. Because otherwise, I'll just go insane. And I think for me that if I'm not busy, I seem to sort of collapse. Yeah. Then all my energy drains. Yeah. But when I'm 
out doing stuff, I'm almost like buzzing. It's like a high. But they say, don't they, like when you're feeling really low, the first thing you should do is just get up. Whether even if you're not going to go anywhere and you just walk around your house, yeah. the minute you sort of sit down and relax and then like sort of switch off, that's really dangerous because then like mm. how often do you get low or depressed and then you can't get out of bed? It's in, impossible to sort of oh, break that cycle. I mean, that, that's... that's I mean, that's really interesting, right? Because when I got diagnosed with anxiety, yeah. one of my fears was that I was going to end up on the lower scale, which is like the, the danger scale of people with anxiety, where they collapse and spend all the time in bed. Yeah. Okay, they, they're fearful of going out. Mm. So then I started doing these challenges where I'm changing like, Rob, 20 quid to see how far we can get from Ardy Park. Yeah. Now, I've got Sweden, he got the Wales. And... That's the first time I've ever been on a plane. So I went in the opposite. That instead of, I was like, no, no, I can't be like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think I gave my time, myself a time to rest. Yeah. Because then, you no, know, then it was another challenge, the walking challenge, and then it was driving the whole coast around the Great Britain. And, mm. and I don't know if that was a, the best thing to do. But also, don't you think like it's really hard? We say it all the time to sort of practice a bit of as cheesy as it sounds. Practice a bit of self love. Yeah. But how, a lot of us don't know how to do that because we're not programmed to do that. Yeah. It's 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 really easy for us to just go back to what we know, just go back to our comfort blanket of like, okay, well, you're either going to pick two options. You're either going to mope around and feel awful about it, or you're going to put all your energy into something and you're right because I do that so often where I'm like okay I need to keep busy and I do and we was talking about it before we started filming this so I'll be busy constantly for like seven weeks and then it'll be half term and I'll have like three or four days and then I'm literally just I've completely crashed yeah. whereas actually I probably should have taken at least one day a week to go okay this day's for me yeah. I need to not see anyone I need to concentrate on myself and do things that I like doing where I don't have to answer to other people, but I find it really hard to yeah. do that. But that is, is finding that balance, isn't and it? I, yeah, and I think that on that journey that I'd done around the coastline, going up was great. Yeah. Because I had no pressure on me. Yeah. Coming back down, I was under all the pressure, the time, the petrol and all that. Yeah. And it started, yeah, it got a lot harder coming back down. Yeah. And, and it, felt like, it felt like serious work. It yeah. drained me, you know, driving 14 hours a day. And I'm yeah, just like, I've bitten off a little bit more than I can chew it. I didn't think it through. Some people can do it straight off, wouldn't be a problem. But mm. because of the mental health side of it, I was parking over on the side of the road like every few hours and getting like 10 minutes sleep. Because the more I stress out, the more it just makes me want to go to sleep. Yeah. And that, that's why I find anxiety affects me. Yeah. It makes me very, very tired. And, but people don't want to hear. When people say, how are you? That's only the truth. Yeah. So when people find out going, how are you? I'm like, yeah, I'm all right. But I don't want to know, do no, they? No, because for a lot of people, it's, I don't feel, feel like it's anyone's fault per se, but we, we're all guilty of being so wrapped up in ourselves yeah. and our own lives that when we say, when you ask someone if they're okay, you want the quickest answer. You don't necessarily want to talk about their life. You want to, you've got enough, everyone's got enough stuff of their own to be worrying with. But when you're the person that's suffering, sometimes the nicest thing is for someone to ask how you are and genuinely want to listen to the answer. Yeah. And it doesn't happen often, does no, it? In, in my group work, when we go all sitting there and I say, how was your week? And they go, yeah, it's okay. And I go, no, what did you, what did you do? Yeah. And I'll say, like, you really want to know? Yeah. And then, then it'll take 10 minutes. And even if we spend the first hour of a group, just people telling me how their week was, mm. that is helping them. Yeah. And it's that, because yeah, they're offloading for starters. Yeah. You hear all oh, what's going on in their week and their worries and things that annoyed them or, and, and that's healthy because they're not carrying it around. Mm. So when you come to write your stuff, do you find that you get more inspiration when you're in a, a darker place? Yeah. Which is that unfortunate? Yeah, I'd sometimes I'm like, oh, am I, am I, because I, do find myself writing about similar things, but I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, whilst I'm writing about things that, you know, are considered perceived to be dark, not only is it, I hope, sort of maybe helping someone else out and raising awareness, but that it does, all of my pieces do end with that positive message yeah. at the end. Yeah. So, um, 
like with my piece volume control which is you know I, the reason I wrote volume control is because a therapist once said to me oh what's it like to sort of be in your brain for a day and like when someone asks you something like that I couldn't think of anything to say off the top of my head I was like um got home and then I sort of started writing down notes or whatever and my the writing process for me I sort of write down on loads of scrap little bits of paper and then I'll sort of bring them all together I'm like okay well that goes with that and then I'll record it on my phone it's all really messy but with volume control I kind of knew instantly where it was going and yeah. how I wanted it to be but that has got a positive message because it's about it's about the the mental health services and the strain on the mental health services and how it's a real struggle to get your voice heard and to say what you want to say. And it's that sort of inner anguish and struggle of, I need someone to listen to me and understand me. But at the end, it's saying, well, I might be this and I might be that, but th there are some things that cannot be labelled that you cannot medicate before because they are they are brilliant and there are yeah. beautiful things about me and great things about me that is more than mental health that is more than all of the labels that you've thrown yeah. at me um but yeah i mean that was volume control i always say is like if i could sum myself up in three minutes i'd probably just give them that part yeah. are you ever scared that what you write could do more harm than good like, oh my God, am I telling that's, too much? Yeah, that's a good question. I, this is, when I was talking to, when I first made this crossover, because I've always done music and then I've sort of crossed over into spoken word and poetry and stuff. And when I was doing this crossover, I, my mum and dad would be the first to say, they were a bit sort of like, oh wow, that's sort of, that's very honest, that's very open. You're sort of putting all of yourself out yeah. there for people yeah. to see. Um, and a few people have said to me, like, are you not worried what people will think? And and I I always say, well, that's exactly why I'm doing it, because it's really, by other people saying, are you not worried about what people think, shows that there is so much of a stigma attached to it, yeah. that everyone is concerned about how people will perceive me, when actually I've got to a point now where I, I really don't care. I've got to a point now where I'm, I feel confident enough in myself that I know I'm so much more than... Any, any label that's been put upon me but it's fantastic that I can talk about it in a positive light and say do you know what yeah this does affect me but it's not the entirety of me yeah and actually you know I managed to I'm high functioning I hold down a job uh, that, a job that I love mm. as well I've got a, a nice circle of friends I've got a good family I've got good people around me um like I'm in a relationship I've, all of these things that are really positive and really good so actually, me talking about something that says, you know, sometimes I'm not okay, I feel like that's that can only do, that can only be a good thing. Do you know what I mean? But I mean, I've I've done that, and then it's been used as a weapon against me. Mm. You know, they go, well, should you be doing this? Should you be doing that? And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, yeah. I definitely should be doing this. I mean, someone said to me, if you've got mental illness, how can you be teaching? How to cope with mental illness. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I can't say, no, I went to, I had to tell a place that obviously I've been diagnosed with mm. it. And all the counselors were like, oh yeah, what one are you on? I'm on this, I'm on that. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, Whew. all of a sudden that weight went off me because <coughs> I wasn't alone. And when you realise that most counselors are counselors because they've been through it. Yeah. You no, know, they've had something go wrong. Um, and it is seen as an illness and not that, you know. You... I think there will always be people who don't agree with it and not just don't agree with it. I think it's because it makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable. Yeah, but then there's these people who go, oh, well, get over it, pull yourself together. Yeah. Now, I've, I remember saying to someone I felt really, really down and, and they're like, oh, God, just deal with it. We'll get like that, we'll get stressed. We'll... Like, yeah, but it don't affect you the same way as me. Yeah. Because everyone's journey is so different. Mm. You know, the, the mental health is like just as much a spectrum as anything else. You know, if we're, if you're... Some people love to shut themselves away and deal with it by themselves and 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 cry and let it all out. And some people bottle it all up and some people yeah. share and some people don't. So I always think it's really... It's so sort of narrow-minded and ignorant to think that we can't all fit into a box like they do and say, well, I'm fine and... 
you know, I'm just going to go about it and, and pretend that isn't happening. Because especially with anxiety, like, you've spoken about anxiety and I've always suffered with anxiety. When people say to me, oh, or not so much anymore, but have done, I'll just get over it or try and put it to the back of your brain. It is absolutely consuming. It's yeah. impossible to yeah, let yeah. something like that because I always describe it as being, you know, if you've ever had sort of like a, a panic attack or, or anything like that, that feeling is a general feeling of I, I can't physically cope a second longer. Mm. I need to, I always feel like I need to be out of this space. I need to be, I need to get out. It's that feeling yeah. of feeling trapped. So it's so ignorant for somebody to say, yeah. you know, just get over it. Because I think unless and until someone really understands what that feels like. Well, I've had, well, I say, two major panic attacks. Mm. And that was the, the first one I ever had when I thought I was having a heart attack. Mm. And we was up the hospital. And that's when I got diagnosed. And then the next one was um, two days before Christmas. Mm. And it was like, we had to go food shopping. And it was just this hot burning feel all over my body and it's literally like every part of my body was on fire mm. and and i thought i was going to die literally mm. thought i was going to die but then knowing and it was this battle in my mind that shane you know this is a panic attack yeah and it was like almost like two people in my head the rational me yeah and the panicking me and and i was on the floor in the bathroom trying to be sick and yeah and it was this inner battle that saying shane you know this is a panic attack you know Bring it down, bring yeah. it down. And and I did manage to do it, and I've been able to cope with them since. But I recognise as soon as like the increased heart rate or yeah. the burning in my body, um, to be able to say, well, watch it, back out, do yeah. something to manage it. Yeah. Um, my daughter fell over and split her chin open. I mean, it was really bad. And I put my thumb there, and all this blood was just squirting out. And again, I felt that burning went right down my spine. Yeah. Um, where all the, the fear and the anxiety all mm. come back through. And it was like, okay, so this is where, this is how my body reacts to panic now. Yeah. And so you can learn that. Um, but it's noticing when it's happening. For you, have you ever had a time when you think you're coping with it and then out of the blue, bang, you've got yeah. really down or... Mm. Mine is like, I would, I'm so sort of... Um, susceptible to feeling other people's pain as well right so if i'm around somebody who is really low or really down i i have a real want to need to fix that or if there's an issue or some kind of conflict i want to fix it i want to help and i i constantly feel like say there's like loads of burst water pipes that i'm constantly trying to put my yeah. hand or like tape them all over to stop it happening when actually it, I'd, it's taken a long time for me to realise I'm I can't control anyone else's happiness, and actually yeah. that's we're all we're all our happiness is sort of within ourselves, and we're in charge of that. But um, yeah, I've always I've always been really really panicky about that feeling of um, of feeling trapped. So for me, it's like anything that sort of takes a long time. Or the feeling like, oh, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm gonna like it. Even before I'm there, I don't know if I'm gonna like that situation. Yeah. So from, I, it took me ages to pass my driving test. Not because I was, I mean, I'm not a great driver anyway, <laughs> but not because I was so bad at it. But I started driving lessons when I was 17. Had I don't know 10, and then I was like, oh, I'm no good at it. Kind of found reasons to not carry on doing it. Then came back to it a few years later. Oh, I'm not. I can't do it. I'm. Do and, the and then I did, you know, in recent years, did my driving test again. Then it took me like five times to do my theory test because I was in like a test situation, which was awful. But all of that was fear that I'd created myself. Yeah. That actually I was probably more than able to do all of it. But it was that feeling of, oh, well, I'm no good at that. I can't do that. And that feeling of panic. It, and it still happens to me now. Even yesterday, I was trying to park my car. And I was trying to park my car. And I was, there was other cars waiting. You know, there's that awful moment of like, oh, there's everyone watching me. And I, was, I felt this level of embarrassment of, oh, my God, everyone thinks I can't drive. I'm really embarrassed. And that was a genuine feeling of panic. And I thought, I cannot. Like, I was sweating. And I was thinking, <laughs> I cannot let something like that but it all starts with it with me thinking I'm not going to be very good at that or people are going to perceive me a certain way. Yeah. And then I panic. Yeah, I mean, I remember the first time I had to teach a group. Mm. 
And the best bit of advice I ever got was that these people have no preconception of you. Yeah. They think you've got the answers. So if you go in there and act as if you've got the answers, <laughs> you can get away with it for a little bit. That's it, so yeah. you can prove it. Um, yeah, and I must admit, I remember passing my test and being in the same place. that I It was Grace, I was trying to say where it was. It was at a train station. <laughs> yeah. And someone had blocked me in. And now I know I could get out of it. But then, I, I, and I, I went right along the car, and I'm thinking, there's no one around, there's no one around. And I remember the sweat was pouring yeah. off me. The more I was trying to get out of it, I was like panicking and making the situation worse, where mm -hmm. the only way I could do it was to go up against the other car yeah. and add bad results. And then I went. And that's fear. I've, oh my, I've ran. It's fear of uh, fight or flight. Yeah. I just, I just ran, got out of there. Yeah. And then tried to calm myself down. And I think, oh my God, should I go back? And, <laughs> yeah. and I mean, we're talking a long, long, long time ago. So hopefully that person's no longer about and ain't going to see the video. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Um, but it's that, that panic. When panic sets in, rational thought goes out the window. Yeah. Oh God, I can, I can be so irrational. In terms of like, I always say, well, I think my friends know me well enough now, but I will, there could be an issue that's not my issue. And I will fixate on something. So I think I'm not very good at being sort of socially aware of how people are feeling about it. So I can quite often think, oh, they're annoyed with me. I've mm. done something to upset them. What have I done? Oh, maybe I won't go out with them tonight because I've obviously done something to upset them. But then there could be other times where people might be upset and I completely <laughs> just <laughs> talking about it. myself and like completely unaware. And that's that's something that I've had, especially when like relationships as well can be really hard with mental health issues. But when I'm sort of, as I've gone through sort of relationships, when I say relationships, I mean friendships, love relationships, colleagues or whatever. It's only in the last couple of years that I've got good people around me that are like, look, I'm not annoyed with you. Like, let's cut it there. Yeah. So I need that. I need someone to cut it off and go, there is no problem. Yeah. Like, because I can fixate on something for hours and hours. Like that anxiety will literally eat me alive sometimes. But do you think that's because people struggle with being up front you always feel like there's an ulterior motive there yeah. or something like that. Yeah, and I think that a lot of, with anxiety as well, there's a lot of, you have problems trusting, don't you? Trusting Paranoia. the situation or people, yeah. yeah. So. I mean, I used to get panic attacks, well, not panic attacks. I used to get really, really anxious about going to trustee meetings. Yeah. Because again, I feel all my life I've had to try and prove I'm good enough to do something. Mm. And yeah, and it, it makes you doubt yourself and it's horrible. You always feel like, oh, I'm going to get found out, I'm a fool, you know, <laughs> and, and I hate that feeling, but I, I, I find it really hard to shake. Yeah. You know, like when I was working in London, I'm thinking, oh no, no I was working for like Merrill Lynch, which is like the big American bank, and, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm going to get found out, I'm a fool, and they're going <laughs> to kick me out. And it's that self-doubt, and self-doubt knocks your confidence, and then when you get down, that, that makes you feel really low about yourself. Yeah. And, that's when we become susceptible to mental health and other illnesses. And what do you do as a, a routine to try and advert that? Do you do a, a positive thinking period or do you do fitness? Do you do... Um, I try and, I mean, it's still going back to writing, but I try instantly. I mean, my phone... I would say, and it sounds stupid, but I am addicted to my phone. I'm addicted to to many things. And I think that with one of my pieces, Waves, is about that. But when we talk about addiction, that it, that I think that's a side note of and, um, of mental health because addiction sort of comes in waves, I think. Of, yeah. And it's really easy to think addiction is just sort of alcohol and drugs when, of course, actually you can be addicted to a feeling of your phone, food. Yeah. Anything. So I think a lot of the times I, I need to set myself targets and be like, right. Because if I had my way, I would really easily sort of stay. If I can be quite selfish in terms of, well, that's what I want to do and I'm going to do that, even though no, I know it's really bad for me, like mentally. Um, when I feel like that, I'm, I make it, I promise myself that I'm going to write it down, whether that be a note on my phone whether that be on a bit of paper, because I think as soon as I think something that's maybe negative or needs to get out of my system, if I write it out, then at least I've kind of shared it with yeah. 
myself in a way, but it feels like it's left my body. Do you do that with positive thoughts as yeah. well? Yeah. 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 Because I think it's very easy to not listen to your, yeah. your own positive thoughts. And I, I, I've, I've quite, I do believe sort of in you attract what you put out. So it's really easy when you talk about negative things constantly and without those positives that can manifest and sort of spiral out of control. So I do kind of write down um, goals, but rather than say, I want to do that, when I'm talking about something that I believe in, I will always say, I, I will do that when I do that, when I achieve this or, and I do that um, at the beginning of every year. I've always done that sort of like a like New Year's resolution. But even when I'm talking about something that I really want to achieve in myself, I'd make sure I'm talking about it well, when I do this and I, I, I will, because actually I am capable of doing plenty, but a lot of the time I just knock myself down. So yeah. sometimes it's really, it's really positive for me to say, actually, no, I will do that. And Are I you good at self-motivating? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's my life. Can be. You already strike me as somebody that doesn't take compliments very well. No, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Um, why do you feel like that? Um, because I've spent, I think, a lot of, from my school years of being 15, 16, this is where I think all of this derives from, of feeling like I, feeling different and not really knowing why I felt different. I feel like there's still that little inkling inside me that says you're even not quite enough or you're not, you don't mm. fit the, fit the norm. And I think a lot of that is, of course, that's ridiculous. And when I think about that logically, that doesn't make sense and it's irrational. But when people say, oh, you're really good at that, or I, I think, oh, yeah, thank you. But for me, I think about all day. Oh, if I do a gig or a spoken word thing, I will come off stage and the first thing I'll do is go up to the person close to me, whether that be my partner or my mum or my dad or a friend, not someone who's come to see me who doesn't know me, but someone who does know me. And say, well, what was that like? Was that okay? And ask because I've got a lot of self doubt, yeah. even though I appear yeah. to be quite confident when I'm on stage. I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm full of self doubt, and yeah. you know, I avoided going on cameras and everything for years. Mm. Um, and it changed a little bit. I've done something for Absolute Radio, yeah, and then I, I listened back to it, and I'm like, I can't hear my own voice. I want to <laughs> listen to it when being in the room, and it's overcoming that fear. So when you see your stuff on YouTube now mm. and do you get pride from it? I do. I get massive pride when people message me or will comment something and say, oh, that's really helped me or I can relate to that because I think, oh, well, that feels good because that's the reason I wanted to do it in the first place. So then I feel like I have achieved. It might be that's my own little measure of success. Like, oh, I, I, that's what I wanted to do and I've set, I, I set out to do that and now people were reacting well and responding and resonating with the things I'm saying so that does make me feel good but nothing is ever quite enough for me I'm like okay well I, I could be better at that and I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I'm always I'm, I'm certainly not someone who doesn't want criticism like I, if anything I'm like well what can I make better okay that well, all right well I need to do that then okay um so how do you deal with constructive criticism, how do you filter out people that just want to criticise you for yeah. making themselves feel better? And how do you fill out that? I mean, do you understand that some people will just criticise you because they're having a bad day, you know, yeah. put yourself down? Yeah. Or that they're, they're criticising you because they want to knock your own confidence mm. so you fail at something? Yeah, I believe that. Um, I think the people that are closest to me and the people that matter, if they give me a bit of uh, sort of constructive criticism that is like, oh, I would have made, why don't you do it that way or put that, I wouldn't have put them in that order or I would have checked, there's been a few things that when my partner will go, oh, that's really good, but I, would, I wouldn't say that word, why don't you put that there or change that bit? And I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense and then I can see that. If I get anything sort of negative either online or someone who doesn't agree with it, I try to let let it just brush yeah. over because... But then do you stew on it afterwards? Oh, yeah, I do a bit, definitely. Yeah. It's, I think it's impossible not to sometimes. You have to be... I mean, I can 
say, okay, well, if you don't like it, that's fine. Like, it, after all, sort of any art form is subjective. There's no right or wrong answer, but it doesn't doesn't make it any yeah. easier when someone doesn't necessarily like what you do. Yeah. And I think I think in today's world, we this just keeps slipping out. Um, we get paranoid for like Facebook likes and mm. things like that, and YouTube likes. And when I do my dance videos um, or you know, the ones we done with yeah. Reverb, if people are not constantly hitting like, 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 mm. like. I get offended by that. Yeah. Um, and I shouldn't do, but I get a lot of criticism for doing them. And I've had to learn to just say, well, it's not for everyone. Yeah. And I know a lot of people don't like me. I know some people think I'm all right. And I can manage that. Um, they're meant to be fun. They're not serious. These podcasts are, are something a little bit different because it's just me talking to other people yeah. and having conversations. And people may criticise them. But I like doing them. Yeah. And I think that's what you have to do for your own satisfaction. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about mental health, it's also a, a dodgy subject. Because people will look at it and go, oh my God, I ain't going to watch that. That's depressing. Yeah. And they don't understand that talking about <laughs> totally. mental health that should be fun. You know, it's that... It is stereotyped. Yeah. Like, and I think, I think we're all a bit guilty of it. I mean, even the closest people to me, I've got a really nice group of friends... But I'm sure that sometimes they must think like, oh, no, I don't want to talk about that. Or that's you don't want to be that person at a party that brings the mood down. Like yeah. I think people quite often think that. But I love I love conversation and I love sort of having real sort of open conversations about these things. And that's that's my favourite thing. And I think if it's helped, you know, even sort of one person or someone relates to it in or has passed it on to a friend even that that, that they, then they sort of understand it and like it and yeah it just means a lot and I think that's why I, the whole reason for me doing this in the first place was to give myself a bit of an outlet and for me to write and to, for it to be therapy and for, to make myself feel better and somehow along the way I've realised that it's maybe made other people feel better yeah. and now I feel like uh, that's that's a really nice feeling but that is something I struggle with like you said with yeah. taking compliments oh I stuff. mean when I've showed it in class it's been a massive hit your, yeah um, the, other, the only other one was um, a little bit that Zoella done a little bit of filming that she spoke about yeah and that had a good reaction but your reaction for your spoken word was just inspirational yeah. they're like oh god yeah, she, she's inside my head <laughs> it's just that um, so I think you, you struck so many chords there and so many people understand how you felt mm. uh, because I, it's probably one of the best bits I've ever seen, read or Thank watched you. that it's so accurate. Yeah. Um, no, you just want to be me, but who is me sort of thing. You know, yeah. that, I forget what I used to be like before I had that anxiety. Yeah. I forget what my body used to feel like. Now I feel tingly in the hands all the time and... Mm. And I forget what it's like to be what they call normal. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the words I hate, but it has to be used so many times. Normal. What is normal? No, yeah. I live a normal life almost, even though I've got mental health uh, illness at the moment. Mm. Some people can have it for a short time. Some people have it from day one, what they yeah. in their life. And I think today's society is totally unaccepting of that. The more effort we put into it, I think we also build more resentment against it. Mm. When you have to force companies to be nicer to people with mental health, yeah. so it does create resentment. Um, looking at the environment that you're working with, music and all that, it has, it's not really got a great history no, it with hasn't. people with mental health. You put yourself under a lot of pressure. Yeah. I'm always just talking about, about you not stopping mm. your life. Yeah. It's just busy all the time yeah I work I work six days a week and then I gig twice in the week normally one of those is up in London I get up at sort of 6 30 for work every morning and I do sort of nine ten hour days and then and especially on a Monday I'll finish one job and then I'll literally get in my car and drive to the next one and then I'll finish that and might go and do something else but I mean like like you said with the history of mental health and music that being linked I think that's because a lot of people with mental health issues are normally quite creative in some yeah. way because it's that's a, a brilliant way of it's an outlet yeah it's yeah, an outlet yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, talking about that then 
how do you feel when you come off the stage and you're buzzing because everyone's been clapping and cheering? How do you cope with that down that you get from it? Um, Arthur, you know, you've been up that high. Yeah, and, and, I, d- and I do get that, especially when I sort of, you know, I've always gigged around SEX and then I didn't realise quite how big the spoken word scene was in, in London. Yeah. And, you know, I went and did one gig and then before I knew it, you, I literally was do, did one gig and then came off and there was three people in the audience were like, oh, come play here, come play here, come play here. And then everywhere you go, there are more opportunities, which is fantastic. And now I've got like a, it's really nice because I've got a little following that come and watch me now in London, which is really good to have that sort of, I don't know, like a, almost like a fan base. But I, it's, it's, once that's, I do, re, I'm full of adrenaline when I'm gigging. And when I come off stage that I still feel that way. Um, but as long as I've got something else to look forward to or another event lined up, whether that be a few weeks away, as long as I've got something that I know is coming up, I, I tend not to feel too down afterwards because I'm still like, oh, that was a brilliant moment. But um, I'm definitely happiest when I'm gigging a lot. Yeah. I mean, the hours that you have to do mm. is going to put a strain on you. Yeah. And so you're gigging in London on Saturday nights? Yeah, um, sometimes Saturday nights, but mainly mainly um, Tuesdays, so weeknights. Yeah. And then getting up for work in the morning, it's never easy. <laughs> no, but again, you're getting a buzz from it, aren't yeah. you, as well? So is that counterbalancing the, the stress of your normal day? I think so, yeah. Because I, I love that feeling of when I'm at work and, you know, I love my job, but everyone gets a, a point at work where they're like, oh okay, you know, I'm having a bit of a tough day or this is particularly stressful. But then when I know I've got that to look forward to, I'm like, oh, well, I get to do this and I get to share everything and I know that I'm going to feel better once I've done it. What's your proudest moment? Um, Personal and then work or youth creation. Or, yeah, or oh, God, I haven't got... Um, my proudest moment, I don't know if it's... An, no, my proudest moment is this. My proudest moment is when I did... I'd done a few gigs crossing over the spoken word, but they were sort of smaller ones and I didn't really, didn't have much sort of self-belief or anything like that. And there was an open mic night, um, Mind Over Matter, a big company in London run that. Um, And there was an open mic night and then there was a three minute slot available and you had to sign up on the door and there was, they let 10 slots go and then that's it. And there was a massive queue at the door and I literally got there and I was the 10th person to fill it out. So I really nearly didn't get it. And um, it was, because it was bank holiday, it was absolutely rammed. And there was a good couple of hundred people there. And um, that is the first time I ever performed volume control live. And I performed it and every single person in the room sort of erupted. And that was the first time that I'd, I'd done something and not really realised it was that good performed it thinking, oh, I'll get an okay reaction. And then before I knew it, everyone was going mad. And off the back of that, then I, I found out, actually, this is the right thing to do. And you should, you need to be prouder in yourself and, and, and have a lot more sort of um, belief in yourself because that's the right thing to do. So that was my proudest moment probably career-wise. And in terms of, you know, working with the kids and stuff has to be um, reverb winning the Jack Petchy award at the O2. Yeah. And that was brilliant because that's obviously Ruth, he's gone on to win the voice now, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's strange looking back all of the little videos of when yeah. they were young yeah. and knowing what they've gone on because you've got quite a lot of success out yeah. of like Max and all them up. Yeah, exactly. And seeing them all back there when like, even like, when Maddie was with them. Yeah. And thinking, oh my God, they've gone on to yeah. do something. I mean, Ruby. The world's at waste. Uh, She's incredible, and I've always, I've always said that about Ruti. Like I, I feel like teaching Ruti was obviously an absolute joy. She's a really nice girl as well as being really talented. But sometimes I teach people, and I'm like, okay, well that's really good because they were at this level. Now they've got to this level, and I've helped that along the way. Ruti came in being amazing, so it wasn't in terms of like making her better it wasn't about that it was just about saying look you are this good we need to do something with it
Um, so that was a really good experience because our reverb is still going, but we've had to really adjust everything now because since Ruti left, we were like, wow, well, now we're going to be are we? Because now we've got to start from the beginning and she used to play guitar for yeah. them as well. Um, but it's slowly coming back into play now and they're doing really well. But, you know, when they performed um, at the O2, that was incredible. Ruti winning the voice. And I would say you've coached being the 10-year show was a big achievement for all of us. That was amazing. Yeah. I'll just mention my go goose thing. Yeah. I mean, that was just... I've never seen a reaction yeah. in a crowd like that. And they go, who thought we can go there and come out crying? <laughs> you know? And it's just... It, Blew, blew everyone away and just the stories it was so personal it was so personal and how did you feel about everything being put out and like that yeah that was that was mad and like we knew that we always said we were going to do something big for 10 years but we didn't know what we were going to do um, and we me and Jodie went on holiday the year before and we were discussing ideas and um, we it was a whole year in, in progress that like we we had so many children from four years old all the way up to 18 and we were like how are we going to write a show and pitch it that is age appropriate for all of them like that was the toughest thing because we wanted to approach subjects that were a bit taboo and we wanted to to talk about things that needed to be spoken about but we also wanted it to be a kid friendly show and we were like this is going to be difficult um but we were so pleased with the outcome and the reaction it got. Yeah. Um, and that was, that's a moment where I think each of us worked really hard and it, it all paid off. Like, it, each of us tried really hard to do something that worked. And, and you know, I was so massively passionate about um, Reverb and what they performed in the 10-year show. And I really believed in that mix and Rooty singing it. It was just incredible. And then, obviously, Jodie had... We Jodie worked every hour under the sun to try and get this to to work out, and it was hands down the best thing we've ever done. It was brilliant. Yeah. Oh, I was I remember when Ruth came out of the sun, and it, it sort of like took everyone's breath away. Yeah. And but I'm not sure it was everyone. Everyone that performed in that. Yeah. Was so spot on. Yeah. And um, yeah, you walk you just think, oh my god, there's so much talent. Young kids have got so much talent. There. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and youth creation and we've uh, uh, enhanced it. Mm. And yeah, I think you know, now it goes and they go to the schools and teach it. Yeah. I think that'd be fantastic. Mm. Um, I do wish there's more out there for recording in, in that area. Yeah. And um, I find that that's very hard. Yeah. I know that I was trying to get a place for us to record the, the reverb. Yeah. Bit. And it was almost impossible. Yeah. No, there's like all books up or, or right. without having to travel really far away. Yeah. And I've I've found that really sad as well in terms of, you know, when it comes to recording my own stuff. Luckily I've got like friends of friends who can sort of help out. But in terms of there being a reliable studio that is affordable, that is in the in the local area. I mean yeah. Stanford, there, like you said earlier, there is nothing. Yeah. Um so yeah, that would be fantastic if that was available. Yeah, I mean it's something that you know I'd like to try and work towards um, the next few years. You said about setting yourself goals yeah. at the beginning of the year. Do you, if you don't meet them, how do you feel? Or do you manage, or do you set them so they're all achievable? Um, I don't set them so they're all achievable. Sometimes they're like really far out and I think, oh, I'm never going to be able to do that, but I try anyway. But in terms of when I don't achieve them, I'm, yeah, it's not... I do take that, that does affect me, but then I'm like, okay, well, I'll just give that another go. I'm not someone who gives up easily. If, if I say I'm going to do something, then I'll make sure I do. <laughs> so, I mean, some of the problems we have is it, that we set our goals too high, mm. we put a pressure on them, when we fail, we feel like yeah. failure, and then that can trigger uh, a mental health effect, yeah. so where you get really down and depressed again. Mm. Um, how do you find, with, with your mental health and speaking about it, mm. are the people around you more acceptable? Um, I would say it's made, in in some cases, relationships with and friendships, it has brought me closer to some people in some respects. 
because there are friends that I didn't know who were dealing with mental health issues yeah. that now I do, and they've been able to come and talk to me about it, which is so that's made me closer to some people. Um, so yeah, I think I'm really lucky though. I've got lots of accepting people around me, people who do understand or at least try to. And I think that's what it boils down to. Whether said, no one can know exactly what it's it like to be like in your head, but to have people around you who want to know. That's the main thing. I have got some good people around there. When I first noticed you in a, in some weird video where you're sitting on a set of doing a really funny sketch was about Christmas or something. Yeah. And uh, and it's very clear you have a lot of talent. Then I see you singing down yeah. the creation when I was taking my daughter down there. Have you ever wanted to go and do sort of like the voice or? Um, back in the day, I did. Um, <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> <laughs> not, not that old. It's <laughs> when, it first, when it first came out, the voice I did audition, um, but I was so sort of unaware of what I wanted to be as an artist. Like that. Now I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't rule anything like that out, um, especially because you know, the, the message in all of my material, the message I want to get across is so important to me that I think a show would be a fantastic platform. Um, but I'm really happy with the way things are going at the moment, so we'll just see where that takes me. <laughs> yeah, and it's when you say that, I definitely, there is a glint in your eye that makes you really want to <laughs> push that forward. Yeah. And as I said before as well, that there's no real outlet for spoken word. No. In, you've got to marry it up with music. Yeah, well, we, I was saying, like, I'm th throwing spoken word out at someone. And there's so many of, the, when I started the crossover spoken word, I'd, I would say, oh, I do spoken word, and then I don't really know what that is. And it's really hard to explain spoken word without saying it's poetry or without saying it's rapping, because it's kind of a bit of both, and that rhythmic flow of, yeah. of doing that. Um, but pairing it up with music was was a good idea and I love it because I get to perform with Isabel as well who used to go to Youth Creation but is now my friend which is really weird <laughs> <laughs> um, but she often sings and, and I'll do the spoken word sections so that's a, a nice partnership as well I, I like, mean I like she's incredibly her. talented I mean her really voice is just um, you know I'll, I'll do I'll put your links in there brilliant thank for you everyone to follow. you said you're on um, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all of them, MEP, and my sort of handle is at MEP, mate, M-A-T-E. Right, brilliant. It may sound a bit rushy, then, but we had a really great long conversation that didn't we Too long. <laughs> Too long. Um, but again, thank you for, no for, for doing this video, but also the, the message you get out there to people is very inspiring. Thank and you. I think you are helping a lot of people with your stuff. And uh, I wish you all the best and hope for your... Get tracks out there soon. That's right, yeah. And we're going to follow you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Cheers.